All right. Hi, everyone. We are live. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Market Matters. Happy 2024. My name is Katie Kuntz, and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. I'm joined, as always, by our senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani. And today we're going to be answering all of your questions about the latest stock market moves. Nice to see you, Bob. Hello, Katie. How was your uh, New Year's and Christmas? Really nice. Got to spend a lot of time with family. How about you? You moved. Yeah, you were in L.A. and you came back to see your family in New Jersey, right? Yep. So I got a nice uh, little dose of the winter weather for the holidays, which was nice, um, but eager to get back to uh, sunny, sunny Southern California. Yeah, you've become a Los Angelino already. You, you, you grew up on the East Coast and already you're getting used to it. I yeah, can see that. pretty quickly. <laughs> Are you uh, uh, having a nice holiday? Uh, yes. You know, uh, I have many nieces and nephews, so I just drive around and basically hand out checks to everybody. That's my job here. So uh, that, that that's what happens when you become, when you get a little older, you, you get people out and it makes me feel good. I enjoy yeah. it very much. Yeah, you're definitely the fun uncle for sure um, around the holidays. So Bob, we have a lot of great questions that we got today. So let's jump right into it. Um, first up, how did stocks finish 2023? And did we see a Santa Claus rally? Well, we had a great end great end of the year. And um, unfortunately, the Santa Claus rally didn't happen. So we, the S&P was up 24%. That's a really good year. I mean, an average year is about 10%. And by the way, we rarely get average years. Um, but three out of four years, the stock market is up, the S&P is up. And as last year was an exceptional year. Remember, we were down 19% in 2022 on a price basis, um, a little bit less uh, if you add in a dividend. But the important thing is we bounced back this year um, and uh, um, the Santa Claus rally didn't work this year. It's one of those rare years. Santa Claus rally is the tendency of the market to go up in the last five days of the year and the first two of the new year. Usually it's good for a gain of about 1.3%. It's actually a very good period because it's a very strong seasonal period. It didn't work. We were down 0.9%. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily a lot. In years where this has happened, there is a tendency for the full year to be weaker than expected, not necessarily down, but generally weaker than expected. I wouldn't put too much in this uh, right now. Uh, we started the year off a little bit on the weak side. We're up today. Uh, we had a report early on. Jobs report was a little stronger than expected. That's good news for the economy, not great news for stocks. Remember, we want job growth to slow down a little because we want inflation to slow down. We want wage growth to slow down a little because the Federal Reserve wants to declare victory on inflation. Um, so we got an, a report later, uh, ISM services report on the service section that was a little weaker than expected. The market actually went up on that because you're in this strange world where you want slight weakness, not a lot. You don't want a recession. You just want the economy to go down because then the Federal Reserve will stop raising interest rates. So this whole game is around the Federal Reserve, and that's kind of why we're up today. But for the week, we're actually down about 1% on the S&P and big like technology, which had a great run last year, um, speculative tech's weak this week. Uh, like the, the thing to look at is Kathy Wood's ARK fund, uh, ARKK. That's sort of like uh, the buy weather for speculative top stocks, tech stocks. It's down about 6%. Uh, the Russell 2000 small cap stocks, another speculative gain here, very interest rate sensitive, down about oh, 3%. Uh, NASDAQ 100, which is the stand in for big cap tech, you know, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA. Uh, is down about two, two and a half percent. Um, and what's up this week is all the speculative, not speculative, uh, defensive stuff, healthcare that got beaten up last year, like Pfizer and Merck, utilities, consumer staples. That's good. That's a little sector rotation uh, going on. So the good news is we're working off some overbought conditions. That's good. It's good for the market to sort of recalibrate. What it looks like to me like yields have been up recently, and it looks like, you know, the market is really anticipating. Um, a bunch of rate cuts that may, or, and we don't know how much of them are going to materialize. And there may be some re-questioning of some of that going on. So overall, a sort of not great start to the year, but considering how we ended, it's not shocking, frankly. So Bob, you mentioned a few things, um, but it's a new year. So what are you watching in 2024? Well, all you have to do to play this, I have been doing this 30 years, and there's a very simple way to play this. Watch when everything gets too lopsided. So what is the prevailing paradigm? Right now, the and why did stocks go up so much? The stock market went up because of the prevailing paradigm, which you could generally call the soft landing. The market came to believe 
that the Federal Reserve was slowly winning its war on inflation. As a result, the market came to believe that the Fed would not keep raising any interest rates. And in fact, they would be cutting rates in 2024. That's the crux of the debate. How much are they going to cut? The market believes there could be as many as six interest rate cuts, one and a half percent. That's an awful lot. So we're figure around, you know, five and a quarter right now, go down the Fed rate, go down to, you know, three, six, three, seven, something like that. That's a lot. If that that's priced into the market, if that changes, remember I just said the yields have been going up. If the market comes to believe, well, maybe they're not going to cut six, maybe they're only going to cut four, they'll have to recalibrate. So that's sort of the main paradigm right here. As of now, the evidence right now is the Fed is indeed slowly winning. Um, and we got uh, numbers today uh, on uh, on wage growth still, still growing, but definitely moderating a bit. So I, the numbers today, to me, indicate slowing in the economy, job growth still reasonably healthy uh, and still on track. Um, there are other components out there um, that you want to watch. Uh, for example, wage growth in general, you want to watch and what's going on there. You want to watch housing. So um, a lot of people talk about what's going on with inflation and they're concerned about it. And, and you know, the housing component is a big issue of that. I think that's going to moderate too in 2024. So overall, I'm still reasonably optimistic that we can get a soft landing. And the, the reason this is remarkable is this very, very rarely happens. When the Federal Reserve raised interest rates like this aggressively in the last couple of years, usually they create a recession. This historically is what happens because they overshoot, they tight, they raise rates too much and they cause a recession. This time, they raised rates really aggressively, and we haven't had a recession yet. Maybe we will, but we haven't had one yet. And the reason for this is hotly debated. The answer is we don't know. The obvious answer seems to be that the Federal Reserve fed it, flooded the, the market with so much money to deal with the pandemic that there's still a lot of money floating around that's helping people out. It's slowly getting spent. And on the on the lower end, it's, getting, it's probably already spent. But that's the obvious answer to why we held up so well. All right, Bob, something else that people are interested in is gold. So what is happening with the gold market? Gold had a great year. Um, we ended, um, I think, uh, right near $2,000. That's a, a historic high, essentially. Um, there, um, You think of the gold market in terms of supply and demand, but largely demand. Um, so think about what actually matters uh, for, uh, for the gold market. Um, so you get several things here. Number one, we have, um, fairly strong central bank purchases that they're, they're a component of, uh, of, of, of the demand. Uh, we had fairly strong retail buying. The important thing about gold to understand is the, the demand side comes from the biggest consumers in the world. Those are retail buyers in India and China. In India, Gold is considered a very important part of overall wealth. Uh, it's often brides often get gold, which they hold on to as wedding presents. Uh, these are bought and this gold is bought and sold in the open market in India. China is also a huge market, very similar culturally. Gold is considered a store of value. It is and a part of family household wealth. Um, and so buying there has been fairly good. Um, Central banks are very interesting because they've been buying more gold recently. And I think the reasons are varied. The reason you would buy gold as a central bank is to diversify your reserves. So if you think about it, you, many of these banks have just dollars and maybe some of them want to move away from the dollar and just hold gold. I mean, it's true. Gold is denominated in dollars, but gold is a diversifier for a central bank. So that also helps prop it up. So overall, gold had a years in a long time. And Bob, um, what are some individual stocks that you would buy and hold long term, maybe for someone's Roth IRA? Yeah, I, you know, this is a, a delicate issue for me because I don't do that. I don't recommend ownership of individual stocks at all in my book. Shut up and keep talking if you want. There's an entire chapter on the history of what I have owned. I have only owned one individual stock, which is General Electric, which was the company that owned uh, CNBC and NBC for many years until it was sold 11, 12 years ago to Comcast. So I'm an employee of Comcast now. 
Um, I had a long and complicated and somewhat disastrous relationship with General Electric stock. I owned it in my 401k. I had a, a lot of it and uh, it was not a smart move. I had a lot of confidence in Jack Welch. I was very influenced by him. I knew him. And he was a wonderful man, a great leader, but uh, I made some mistakes on, on being overconfident in General Electric's leadership. Um, I own, and in, in the book I stay, I tell you what I own. And I have been a Jack Bogle disciple for 25 years. Bogle was the founder of Vanguard. He was a big believer in diversification using index funds. Uh, my primary holding has been the S&P 500 for many, many years. But I also own a mid-cap fund. I own a small cap value fund. Um, these are simple funds that stay with the market. So it's an international fund. It's not very complicated. When I show it to people, they look at me and say, this is it. You're the you know senior markets correspondent for CNBC and you own you know, the S&P 500 ETF and you own a small cap value, that's it. And they, they, I, they seem to want me to say something weird and exotic, like I own leveraged inverse Malaysian bonds or something crazy. And I don't. And the reason is you can try diversifying all you want. Most of the time, it doesn't work very well. And I can see this. I've been watching this for 30 years. So knock yourself out if you want. Bogle used to say, if you really think you can outperform the 10% of your savings and go knock yourself out. See if you can outperform. But he said, if you know how to do this, if you really pay attention to the time you're spending, how much it's costing you to do this and going in and out of the market and the market you think you can do, I'll bet you, Vogel said, you are not going to outperform the market. And I believe that's right. With that said, I still have a couple of small ETFs and things that I play in and out of, but it's not a very serious kind of investment. Mostly I own the S&P 500 mid cap, small cap international fund, simple funds like that. So sorry to disappoint you. Well, I know you all want to think that there's some massively easy get rich quick scheme that's out there. And there isn't, there really isn't. Stay with the market. This week, I did a story on dividends. You can go on tradertalk.cnbc.com and see it. And once again, the S&P put out its dividend survey. And every year they calculate the value of the S&P 500 with reinvested dividends. So they have numbers going back to 1926. And it's very clear that if you take the dividend of the S&P 500 has been below 2% for a while now, which sounds like who cares about 2%. But if you take that 2% and reinvest it and let it stay there, you get compounding interest and the numbers get really, really big. It looks small initially, 2% of the S&P every year, but you're making money on money. It doesn't cost you anything. And after a while, that 2% is 2% or that 2%, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you go back and look at the S&P's figures for the total appreciation, price plus the dividend since 1926, 40% of the total return is from the dividend. 60% is from the price. That's when you reinvest the dividend. So that's compounding interest. That's, com that's the value of compounding. And that's how you get rich. You don't get rich by picking Tesla as the next Tesla. It, it doesn't work. Maybe you think you can. Go ahead, knock yourself out. But I am telling you, long term, the way to get wealthy is the lazy man is to let your money work for you. Make money off of money and do nothing. And it just keeps compounding. Sorry, it's that simple. Look, Buy the book and look at it. I'll give you a couple examples of how it works. Yeah, I definitely think that's helpful advice um, for everyone watching, Bob. Um, so next up... You know, something that we've been seeing for a while, um, you know, high prices, inflation. So why does it feel like things are so expensive, even though we hear that inflation is cooling? Yeah, this is an interesting behavioral economics problem. And there's a couple of things around it. Um, inflation is definitely going down. But a lot of prices on items remain high and they still remain high for months. And people have a hard time getting that out of their head. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example, real estate. One of the sticky things about inflation has been real estate, but real estate prices tend to lag inflation. You're going to see like, like rental prices went through the roof in 2021 into 2022. You're going to see rental prices and, and home prices, I think, uh, probably moderate in 2024. Uh, I think I certainly think you'll, you'll see rental prices moderate. That's going to have an effect on inflation, but people have it in their head. Rental prices are up. Well, actually, they are, but they're not going up like they used to before. Um, 
there were prices on some other items like you know healthcare, for example, that increased more than the cost of inflation. That's definitely an issue uh, that's out there. But a lot of people just have stuff in their head that's wrong. Like I know people who think the price of eggs are through the roof. The price of eggs have been dropping for almost a year now. It's not true. And so people, it's not misinformation. It's sort of people come to want to believe it because they want to have something to talk about. So I'm not saying that inflation isn't real. It's definitely real. But uh, sometimes people don't know how to look at this in the right way. The numbers are definitely coming down. And that's why the stock market rallied. Believe me, if the people who pay attention to this, including financial reporters like myself, so looked and said, oh, my God, not only inflation is not only going down, it's staying high um, uh, and, and increasing. Believe me, people would be freaking out and the Federal Reserve would be freaking out. And the stock market would be down. And that's not happening. So you can look to the market and the Federal Reserve's position to indicate the Federal Reserve has clearly sent messages that they're done raising rates, that they hadn't ruled it out. You'll hear people or conservative call hawks say occasionally, well, we not, you know, we don't know if we're entirely done. Uh, but the market's pretty good at sniffing things out. The market has sniffed out that the trend in inflation is down. And you should use that. I understand why some people, this is again, this is stuff in your head, can't get it out, it's hard, um, is moving in the right direction. All right, next up, Bob, um, can earnings reignite the market rally? What do you think? Well, market rally, we had just have a historic high December you know, 29th. I don't, I mean, I know people think that we had an awful week. The S&P is down 1% this week. So it's, <laughs> I don't think we need to reignite anything. I think what this hap what happened this week is actually very good. You, you, you can't have the stock market keep going. We had November, December, just crazy moves up in the stock market. You can't sustain that. That doesn't happen because there's got to be some relationship between the stock market and expectations for earnings. So right now, the analysts are expecting the S&P earnings to go up about 12% in 2024. The actual dollar numbers, the total aggregate of earnings for the S&P, if you add it all up, is supposed to hit a record, actually. Uh, and dividends, I just did a story this week on it. Again, you can tradertalk.cnbc.com. Go there. You can see it. Dividends paid out in 2023 also hit an all-time record. And, and American investors got more money from, from corporations than they ever got before. Almost $600 billion in dividends were paid out in the S&P 500. So the market's done pretty darn well. Um, and I don't need, you know, we need to reignite a rally. I think we've got a rally. And uh, the question is, can the earnings keep up with it? I've said this before. The one thing that kind of worries me, I've seen some early earnings reporters the top line is uh, the bottom lines look okay. Uh, you saw this today with Constellation, but the revenues are a little light. And what's happening, it seems like some of these consumer companies, because inflation is cooling, they can't raise prices as much anymore. And so they can't sort of use this as an excuse to raise prices. And that's a little bit different. And if you get somewhat slowing demand or changing consumer tastes, you know, like in you know, food companies, so you, you get inability to raise prices and you get demand shifts, that can cause a lot of problems with revenues. So I would watch the revenue situation right now um, over earnings for some of these companies. We'll start next. I'll, I'll know better a couple of weeks from now how things are doing. Yeah, we'll see how things play out this earnings season. Um, last question for today, Bob. Something we've been talking about for a while, but it sounds like it might be getting closer. Um, what's the status of a Bitcoin ETF? Well, I just did something today on it again, <laughs> tradertalk.cnbc.com, or you can go um, on the CNBC webpage and look for it. But we are uh, all waiting with bated breath, literally, for this thing. There's 13 applications for a spot Bitcoin ETF to be able to trade Bitcoin. And the reason this is a big thing is right now, if you want to trade Bitcoin, you have to create a whole account. You have to go to an exchange. It's difficult. You have to have passwords that you can lose. With a Bitcoin ETF, it's the same thing like a gold ETF. There would be a custodian that would protect the Bitcoin. It wouldn't get stolen. You don't have to remember your password other than the password to you know, get access to your account there, but you don't have to remember some elaborate password. Um, the this is like a gold ETF. 
I was very involved in the gold ETF 20 years ago. It started in 2004. Prior to that, you wanted to own gold. You had physical gold. So, you know, old guys would have like gold coins in their basement and things like that. There, people still do. You could still own gold coins and gold bars, but you don't need to anymore. With a gold ETF, there was a custodian who has a bank vault. I actually went to these bank vaults and saw them, saw the gold, I saw the silver, uh, and they keep it there. And if you want to sell it, you sell it. And if they take the gold, actually take the gold out, they physically do that. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to sit there and hold gold in your pocket and crazy stuff like that. It's the same thing with Bitcoin. Here, you have a custodian that takes care of everything. They charge you a fee, by the way, to do this, uh, just like they do with gold. And it's just a lot safer. Now, again, Katie, we've talked about Bitcoin before. I have real problems with Bitcoin. I don't think it has solves a tremendous use case other than for people who are in countries where they're they're concerned about their money or their safety. There's a use case. But other than that, I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin. I'm a big fan of blockchain, decentralized finance, smart contracts. I think they're revolutionary, not so much on Bitcoin, but it doesn't matter. What I think doesn't matter. What matters is some people want to own it. I don't think it's proved itself as a as an asset class, but if some people want to own it, they should ought to be able to own it safely. Bitcoin ETFs, spot Bitcoin ETF is a safer way to own it. And that's why I've come to back this. So we're waiting for the Kathy Woods ARC Fund is supposed to be given a, a thumbs up or thumbs down next week. We're going to have Kathy Wood on uh, 1230 on Monday on Halftime Report Eastern Time, and on ETF Edge. You want to watch it? 1.10 p.m. Monday. Eastern Time, etfedge.cnbc.com, etfedge.cnbc.com. Kathy will tell us what's going on, um, and we'll see if it actually happens. We'll probably know um, early next week. So I'm quite excited about it. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see. I feel like we've been talking about that for a long time now, um, so we'll be watching. Um, but thank you, everyone, for all of your great questions, as usual. And thank you, Bob, um, for being with us today and all of your responses. Great questions, as always, and look forward to being with you in 2024, everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Bye.